Okay, hello. Uh, delighted to welcome you all to Idea Space with the Urban Design Group, Urban Naus, and me, Christopher Martin. Um, I'm an urban designer and planner focusing on the design of public realm and streets. Um, I'm on the executive committee of the Urban Design Group and co founder and director of Urban Strategy at Urban Movement. For this episode, um, we'll be focusing on human behavior, getting to the bottom of how urban spaces make us feel, and ultimately how it can affect our decision making. I'm joined all the way from San Francisco by environmental psychologist, author, and researcher, Lily Bernheimer. Lily, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, and thank you so much for having me on the show. No, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'm really grateful for you taking the time out to speak with us. Um, just to kick things off and, and, and get everyone in the mood, I was wondering um, if you could set out your thinking um, and, and how you approach for design of urban places. And if you had anything you wanted to share, feel, feel free to uh, jump in. Right. Yes, I um, will start just by telling you a little bit about my work at Spaceworks Consulting, uh, my book, The Shaping of Us, um, and really, you know, what this means about why I believe environmental psychology is so important to delivering spaces that are better for human well-being. I began my work in the built environment back in 2008 in New York City, working with a nonprofit called Open Plans or the Open Planning Project. Uh, and we were working on the amazing livable streets transformation that was happening in New York City at that time, along with groups like Project for Public Spaces, Transportation Alternatives, um, really transforming so much of the city's roadways um, into spaces for pedestrians and uh, cyclists and public spaces. We were doing this specifically through more technology-based projects, so things like creating a collaborative website for people to request new bike parking locations from the Department of Transportation. So through this work, I was exposed to user experience research and design principles. I learned that when we're creating technology like smartphones or the applications we use on them, we typically invest in user experience testing and tweaking uh, to refine these products and try to make sure they work in terms of human psychology and behavior. Now, not saying that that process is perfect, um, but it really goes a long way towards making sure that the technology we use in our everyday lives um, works better for human needs. I also learned that we don't often engage in this type of user experience research when it comes to the design of our buildings and public spaces. And I thought, well, this is really important. We need to be doing more of this. I think that we could avoid many of the problems that we encounter in our built environments if we just put a little bit of energy into thinking about how they work for human behavior um, and then bringing that sort of iterative process where we understand how, look at how one space works and feed those lessons back into the next space. This led me uh, over to the UK to get my master's in environmental psychology at the University of Surrey. And for those who don't know, environmental psychology is a interdisciplinary wing of behavioral science that focuses really on this dynamic of how both built and natural spaces impact human behavior, well-being, um, the, really the dynamic interplay between humans and our environments. Mm -hmm. um, and then we use what we learn from this research to strategize how we can design workspaces, streets, living spaces to be better for collaboration, health, um, to encourage us to behave more safely or even to recycle more. I co-founded my uh, consultancy, Spaceworks, to bring this research into um, practical application, uh, working to help design working, living and urban spaces that truly work for the people and purposes they serve. Looking across a wide range of uh, research and case studies in urban environments, workspaces, living spaces, um, even hospitals while writing my book, I found there were two qualities that kind of consistently came up that were really core to human well being across the environments we spend time in, and also to creating spaces that we find aesthetically pleasing to spend time in and look at. So the first is ordered complexity. When we look at beloved streetscapes and 
architecture, urban environments around the world, we often find this sort of balance of order and complexity. There's a sense of coherence between the different buildings in the street or a city, uh, but they're also, they're not all exactly the same. There's order balanced with this sort of organic complexity. Then on the other hand, we have this quality known as collective efficacy, which refers to a common sense of agency, um, sort of informal social control and uh, trust in a community. And what we find is these two qualities really kind of uh, um, uh, go together and support each other in various types of human environments. So, um, I think many of your uh, listeners or watchers are probably familiar with this um, famous example of a shared street, a shared space street transformation um, from the Laveplein mm. uh, roundabout in the Netherlands, where um, removing stop signs and um, other directive signage and uh, bringing in, you know, greenery roundabouts. Um, uh, uh, fountains, other things that created a more beautiful space um, was part of a transformation that made this space safer and also um, made it more effective for cars and pedestrians and cyclists to move through. So I think that this is a really beautiful example of collective efficacy, how removing controlling elements and enabling people to interact with each other, trusting them to follow their instincts um, can, can enable a type of collective efficacy um, that actually can work better spatially in many ways than trying to control every little bit of people's behavior. I've also um, had the opportunity to do some work strategizing around um, vision zero and things that we can do with the design of street spaces to help subtly encourage pedestrians to be safer when crossing the street. Um, and uh, one of the interesting, um, exciting ideas we came up with was uh, to bring some more uh, sort of colorful street paintings um, into intersections like the one you see here that do sort of still subtly um, uh, give a sense of um, maybe which way cars are coming or where people might walk, um, but also bring a little bit of that um, sense of ambiguity and um, bring a bit more ordered complexity uh, to the aesthetic quality of the environment. Um, and I think this is a great example of how environmental psychology can help us deliver better spaces. So, um, that's, that's sort of a very quick overview of some of the big um, picture of my work and uh, the, the research that I've covered in my book. That's, that's brilliant. Thanks so much for that. There's a, a loads to take away in there um, for urban <laughs> designers. Uh, uh, thanks for that. Um, I, I suppose one thing I'd like to explore a bit more and sort of boil down um, into the challenges we face um, and certainly something that I, I, I'm sure you are and, and I'm faced with every day is, in our work is, is sort of taking people with you on, on a process of a, of a, of a design process and, and working with people to deliver change and deliver improvements, um, especially in our streets and communities. Um, I think often one of the, the biggest problems or, or sort of challenges we face is, um, is, is, is getting people to change. And I was wondering if you could, if you could, if you could um, offer some, some insight as to um, why as human beings we find change so difficult. <laughs> that's um, that's a really great question and one that environmental psychologists spend a lot of time thinking about, um, especially uh, why people tend to have such difficulty and negative reactions to anything that has to do with, you know, even very minor changes in our neighborhoods, like, oh, you know, yes, we're going to replace that um, street light over there, or <laughs> um, uh, these kinds of things can stir up really, really uh, negative, very emotional reactions from people. So um, one reason we believe uh, we may react so strongly to changes to our environments is that we actually sort of um, use our surroundings to reinforce our own sense of identity. Um, this is an idea that's known as place identity. And it's not just simply, you know, oh, I'm from New York, I, I identify as a New Yorker. It's more about, um, you know, more subtle aspects of your own identity that you may sort of link to the place you live. We, you know, many of us, we want to believe that we're, um, 
effective people that we um, that we're consistent that we're kind of um, uh, have a sense of continuity throughout our lives. And so when we see our environments changing, um, it can feel like a threat to our own identity um, and perhaps even remind us of our own mortality in some ways. Um, so, you know, then you have more specific issues that come up if, if you know, you, you're a person from one type of community that maybe um, is now aging out of that place or, you know, there, there are economic uh, clashes that are being represented by changes to the environment that also clearly can trigger more particular um, things about identity. That's great. I mean, it's really, I think it's really interesting to put it into context as well, so you can actually understand that the, the sort of the trauma that people go through sometimes in these changes. But um, I, I think another another sort of thought I'd like to test with you is um, we, especially in street design, which is where I sort of focus. Um, it's it's very much governed by mechanistic and engineering led um, responses as a norm. Um, when what we're actually trying to do a lot of the time, if not all the time, is influence human behaviour. Why do you think applying sort of environmental psychology to the design of places isn't commonplace? It's not commonplace, um, and, and especially not as commonplace as it should be. This is another great question, and um, yeah, I, I wish I knew the answer exactly because I spend a lot of time trying to convince people that they do need to be paying more attention to um, to human psychology and behavior. I mean, I think that uh, we, you know, it, at least in um, uh, certainly American and, and British society. Um, we have this really strong uh, identification with the idea that humans are sort of rational and logical creatures. And I think we see that in this mechanistic approach to urban design transportation um, <clears throat> strategy, like you're saying, well, okay, if we just lay everything out very logically, um, you know, that's the way we truly work and think. So that will work for people. Um, and what we find when, when we look at, um, behavioral science research is that we're really not as rational and, and logical as uh, we want to think that we are. Um, you know, the, there's all kinds of um, ideas about, well, if, if people only had the appropriate information, if they only knew, um, you know, how detrimental um, uh, flying or, or driving or something was, they wouldn't do that. But we find is information enough information isn't enough to sort of guide or change people's behavior. We really need to tap into more um, emotionality um, to be able to do that. So I think, yeah, we, we want to think that we're logical, basically. Even when <laughs> we're shown that we're not. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's something I've always reflected on as well. And, and it's the same reason why I don't think we work with enough artists in, in, in the sort of in the, in the public realm, because mm -hmm. the idea of testing ideas with people who think differently, I think, is, is, is incredibly important, because obviously we can't, we can't design, design a space for the, for the use we want that for any one moment, because uh, what we need from a street or a space changes throughout the day. So the idea of sort of, of working with different people is, 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 is really, really important, I think. So, um, and actually using those kind of different perspectives is, is key as well. But yeah. I think it's probably, it probably tees into my, uh, another question I wanted to explore, but I mean, cities globally are, are under, undertaking enormous change at the moment. Um, and, and in London, especially, we've, we've signaled a, a gear change towards getting more people to walk and cycle, um, which uh, the central government have just released their sort of their new targets and ambitions. Um, personally, I, I, I've been working on a, a theory of hedonistic urbanism for some years, um, saying that we have to make what's good for the planet, good for people and good for cities, the most enjoyable, uh, the most fun and the most self-indulgent option. So we queue up for it um, rather, rather than um, rather other ways around it. But um, from your experience, um, what do you see as the best way um, that we can invite people to change their behaviours? Um, behaviours that have often become commonplace in their lives um, in favour of things that are in fact better for them and, and better for society as a whole. Um, well, I absolutely agree with what you said that um, if we want people to change their behavior, we we have to make it um, easy, we have to make it uh, social, we have to make it um, fun and engaging. Um, you know, there, there's certainly a time and a place for um, for 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 being serious and for um, for. Yes, yeah, for, for sharing some some information about how grave the problems we're facing in the world are um, and to to sort of um, 
you know, particularly at the policy level to um, get the seriousness of these changes we need to make across. But when it comes to trying to change uh, behavior of everyday people at the everyday level, um, you know, I think it's really, really important to just try to make it as, as seamless and enjoyable as possible. Um, so uh, you know, the, the behavioral insights team in the UK has um, come up with this um, a mnemonic, um, uh, which uh, makes it quite easy to remember what some of the best ways of um, uh, integrating uh, these behavior change policies are. It's the, the mnemonic is EAST, so it's uh, easy, attractive, social and timely. So um, thinking about, say, uh, you know, wanting to encourage people to cycle more or um, any, any other sort of, uh, or, or to live in places where they will be less dependent on cars. Um, you want to think about all those things. I think the timely, um, the timely one is quite interesting. There's a lot of research to suggest that if you can encourage people to make changes at sort of key moments in their lives where they might already be making a lot of other changes. So that could be like um, leaving leaving their, their family home when, when they're um, teenagers or, or in their 20s, um, uh, forming new partnerships, having children, changing jobs, all of those things. If you can sort of um, get, if you can get to people at a moment where they're already making a lot of changes, um, transportation behavior often changes when people have children, for instance, yeah. and then they think, oh, all right, well, yes, I was all, I was all excited about living in the city center and cycling to work, but now I have children and that, that's all, that's all the window. It, it, that's an identity change. And so <clears throat> I think if we can think about, um, targeting people at those key moments and um, getting them to understand how this new uh, point of their identity in their lives, well, you're going to be a parent now and yes, you'll have new responsibilities, but here's how it can also be fun to have your kids be in the walking school bus or you know, what, whatever those yeah. um, changes might be. But then yes, I think it, you know, it's so important to make, um, uh, obviously we, we need to have places for walking and cycling um, we need to ensure that they're um, they're safe and accessible and that they don't leave people off at you know so many times there's a bike lane it's great and then suddenly you're you're dumped in yeah. the <laughs> street with nowhere else to pick up so you know thinking in a coherent sense but but making them beautiful attractive spaces for people to spend time uh, Daniel Kahneman is um, a famous uh, Nobel Prize winning psychologist, um, uh, behavioral economist, and, and he said, uh, no one ever made a decision because of a number, uh, they, they need a story. Um, and so I think we need to think about that in, in, in creating stories for people to follow and engage in our yeah. studies. Thinking fast and slow is definitely one of my favourite books of all time yeah. as well. So yeah, <laughs> probably behind me somewhere. <laughs> um, right. I just, we, we just on that as well. We, we, we hear so much about um, about nudge theory and, and, and those kind of um, yeah. that kind of idea. Um, I was wondering if you um, if you could sort of add a bit more insight about um, about nudge theory and how we can use environmental psychology to sort of help nudge people to change and and indeed be safer, as you were mentioning um, in your intro there about how people can be safer on streets. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so to start with a, a slight caveat, I, I think nudge theory, theory can be taken too far. Um, I think sometimes um, uh, mnemonics like the ones I, I mentioned, um, they're really useful to help us remember like the sort of high level concepts, but it yes. is also really important to drill down into issue specific research and, um, you know, not not just sort of um, uh, <laughs> get carried away with the, the more simplistic framing of things because um, it, it, these things can operate very differently sometimes for, for uh, different types of behaviors or, or different issues. Um, but uh, that said, um, I had the opportunity, as, as I mentioned briefly, to kind of try to apply some of these insights to um, this uh, Vision Zero conundrum, mm. uh, which is, you know, I, I think a lot of cities and, and certainly cities can do can do much more to try to um, influence drivers to uh, to to be safer. And, and that's the real 
issue that we're facing with Vision Zero, but at the same time, um, pedestrians are part of the equation. And, and so we were looking at, well, can we do kind of traffic calming for pedestrians? Like what are these subtle things that we can um, bring in to try to impact um, pedestrian behavior? Uh, so, so going back to the, the East mnemonic, um, making it easy and attractive for pedestrians to uh, to cross um, intersections in the places that are safest for them to do so. Um, those are those are really really important. I mean, what we found over what we found overall is that um, pedestrians really want to take the the shortest um, uh, path across the intersection that they can, and so what that means is that we should. We should make the we should be sure that the shortest path is the safest path or try to you know sort of realign um or or shorten crossing distances at the safest um areas uh, sort of just rearrange things to make sure we're taking advantage of that um and then we also found that where there's a really big problem is if um if there's sort of a mismatch between the actual danger at an intersection and um, the perceived danger. So there might be some place where we've uh, shortened a crossing distance because um, we are uh, trying to signal to drivers that they should slow down, sort of bottlenecking thing. But if it turns out that's still a quite dangerous um, place, you know, it, it, we want to be sure when crossing distances are shorter that subtly says to pedestrians, oh, this is just a little, little, um, not very long place for me to cross. Well, I maybe don't need to be quite as worried then. Um, and then, and then the attractive point as well, you know, if, if there's, um, an area that we want people to be drawn to, um, then uh, let's invest in making it more beautiful, attractive, appealing, um, color, plantings. Um, we also found uh, that there was a, an interesting sort of thing that came up where um, sometimes there would be, you know, uh, cycle parking or other um, amenities sort of along the side of a road. And that had a uh, this sort of edge effect of funneling pedestrians to um, to be more likely to cross at the at the marked crossing because those things it, it's not guard railing where it feels like a sort of imprisonment environment but at the same time these are these are things that we really need in the pub public realm anyway and um, yes. and it kind of funnels people towards the towards the right um, yeah so it's because planting or things like that and yeah 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 so um, yeah those uh those were a few of the things um that we found were really useful in nudging pedestrians to try to cross um to to uh cross streets in in ways that would be safest. yeah make the easiest and the most beautiful way the safest way and then everyone yeah. will be happy yeah. yes yes absolutely <laughs> that's, that's brilliant thank you um I'm, I'm sure we could talk all day about this but i'm i'm, I'm afraid that's that's all we've got time for today um Great. There's a huge amount to take away and, and, and apply for urban designers in, in your work and, and what you said today. So I, I know this will be a really valuable session for everyone involved in shaping cities. So, so thank you. Um, and, and it just um, leads me also to say to, to thank you to everyone who's listening into this as well. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Idea Space um, by the Urban Design Group, Urban Nows and me, Christopher Martin. Uh, there'll be more episodes coming your way. So please do get in touch if you have any questions um, and check out the events page of the Urban Design Group to see more. Um, around urban specials. So thanks everyone and thank you Lily. Thanks.